right. Today on Dear Founder, we have Angie Tebby, founder of Ray Wellness. And honest to God, it, it, you must be living under a rock if you haven't seen Ray on the shelves or you don't shop at Target, um, which I know that is probably not the case for most of you guys listening. But um, Ray Wellness is everywhere. And I'm so excited to dive into this story behind the brand because you see it on the shelves and you pick it up and you're like, what does this do? What is this supposed to do? How did, what's going on here? This is an amazing, amazing brand that is supporting health and wellness in a huge, huge way. They are thriving. They are sold at multiple retailers. And I'm so excited to have Angie here to share her story with us. So Angie, welcome to Dear Founder. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be talking with you. Um, me too. And like I like I do with everyone, I, I think the best way to get started is really to dive into your story and how you got to where you are today with Ray. Amazing. You just want me to start? I'm yeah. Happy to. Okay. Just where start. do I begin? Um, I, I always like to say that I grew up in a really holistic household um, as, as a kid, um, my mom was a nurse. My dad was into Reiki homeopathy. I was a super weird five-year-old, like meditating on the lawn in Fargo, North Dakota, but also making business cards. So it's kind of funny that that is kind of what I'm doing is blending, blending all of those things. But, um, my, I'm of three girls and my parents always said the world is, is large and it's not this homogenous. So go figure out what it is that just lights you up and, um, and go chase it. So to me, initially, um, after college, what that looked like was corporate, right? I, I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to learn from really smart people. And so I started my career at Microsoft out in Seattle for a couple of years before moving back to the Midwest, um, back to Minneapolis, where I just started direct dialing Fortune 500. So I'm like, there's a lot here. I don't know. You know, some friends are here. We were back for my husband's job at that, at that point. And um, I totally fell into retail. So I spent 13 years at Target as a merchant which as you know, is create in the private label space. So that's creating brands from scratch um, and, you know, leading bigger and bigger teams, spent some time in Canada, opening up the Canadian operations and leading, you know, really big diverse teams there. Um, you know, that's, that's a whole other podcast episode. On its own. I mean, I was going to say ha my husband's family is Canadian and they have oh. been, you know, sitting Shiva for years that Target left. So that was yes. like the biggest thing when Target opened there. And it was very sad, a very sad day when they closed. So, yes. Yes. So I just, I mean, I, I had the, the most brilliant career and, and amazing humans at that company. And, um, it got to the point where, um, you know, my life was becoming fuller. I had two kids at that point. I just had my third six months ago. And so now I've got three dudes um, at home, but I um, life was becoming fuller and fuller and I was decreasing on the priority list because I love what I do. And I'm a student of what I do. If I'm not learning, I'm not growing. If I'm not growing, I'm not happy, but I knew that this wasn't probably the way and, and, and something needed to change. And so for me, um, I was driving home one, one night and I'll never forget, I pulled off to the side of the road and got physically ill. And it was kind of like the, the physical wake up sign of what the universe had probably been trying to show me for a little while. And that was, I was burned out. And, um, you know, maybe you should think about your own well being. <laughs> this is maybe a sign. And so I took a little bit of time to really think about it. And, it really brought me back to how I grew up and my roots. And, and if I had friends calling me saying, you've been trying to honor your late father for a really long time. When are you going to do this wellness thing you keep talking about? Like, when is this actually going to happen? And so in a matter of weeks, um, I wrote a post-it note. I'll never forget. It had 10 ideas of what I could be doing. And I was like, can I really do this? And um, I, I made the decision then to leave my corporate career in pursuit of a why, not a what or a how. I had no idea at the time. Um, but my why really was how do I start to walk the walk, not just for myself, but a lot of women that feel the way I do around well-being, personally and professionally. And I knew if that was my professional um, direction, I would also, you know, feel that responsibility to walk it personally. And so I had 10 ideas, not one of them was Ray, not one of them was what I'm doing now. It was, it was really just like, do I think I could do this? Um, something, whatever this is. And I just took the time off. Um, I was privileged enough to be able to take a couple months off and take care of myself. And again, the universe really showed up for me in a matter of, of a couple of months 
where I just started to see the white space as I was trying to take care of myself. My hormones, I had high degrees of cortisol. You know, I was trying to seek out supplementation for my own needs because mm. I believe in food first, but I also believe that the amount of energy that we put out as women on a daily basis, sometimes we need a little bit of support. And as I was looking for myself as entrepreneurs say, I just saw the white space immediately. And that was, I saw a lot of brands that were very expensive, as I like to say, for the 1%, not inclusive um, for, you know, a lot of wealthy white women holding, you know, hundred dollar multivitamins. And that just wasn't speaking to me. And then I would go to retail. And what I would see is a lot of um, brands that either weren't made with women in mind, you know, a genderless approach um, and or a lot of gummies and a lot of sugar, right? And that that just wasn't resonant to my needs. And so as everyone says, I, ha I had this idea of how do we create a company that stands for the well-being for all and, and also has the vibe of like, it shouldn't have to be a full-time job. It's not striking yoga poses on Machu Picchu. It's like drinking an extra glass of water, really attainable and accessible in its approach. From a retail price point perspective made sense and could fit into women's lives and was really, really inclusive. Um, and what that means to me is, is you see it show up in, in um, our team and who we employ. You see it show up in our approach. You see it show up in our voice. Um, but you also see it show up in, in our marketing. And I'll never forget, for example, our first photo shoot. I was like, okay, we had this couple, right? Because we're talking about our In the Mood product, which is all about sexual um, wellness. And I was like, what stereotypes do we want to break down? What are the genders? What are the ages? How do we think about, you know, the ethnicities of what this couple is? And I'll never forget, like, even in our first photo shoot, it was so baked into our DNA that, like, we need to celebrate the diversity um, that exists in this world. And so that was the idea. And so I was kind of heads down in pursuit of that idea, but obviously um, wanted to do it at scale so that we could impact um, a lot of women. So you have a background in product creation, obviously. I mean, you worked at Target in private label. So you kind of knew what to do and who to call. And I, but like, did you when it it's came to this? <laughs> It's, because were you doing supplements like in, no, your, in your past life? And because no. there's, that's a whole other thing than like a up and up paper plate. Right. Or like, so, so this is, this is, this is the thing, like everything that you do in life prepares you for the next thing. I fully believe that. So did I, I had a great toolkit. I really, really did. Right. Like I understood brands. I, I followed and listened to the consumer, my career, but nothing prepares you for starting a company, nothing prepares you, you know, you're talking specifically about product. No, I'm not a chemist. I had no idea. Um, nothing prepares you for fundraising, you know, like product is one side, but like nothing will prepare you. Um, you just, you just do the best job you can with the information you have as you're, as you're a founder. So what was in that toolkit that you found helpful when you were first starting, right? Um, first and foremost, um, listening right? Like I knew how to listen and um, not just hear, but listen to the consumer. And so I knew throughout my career, um, you know, I was in marketing, even at Microsoft, that what they say is not necessarily what they mean. And so hearing versus listening, I think, I think that that is the first thing um, that I always go back to is like, I'm not creating this company for me, I'm not creating this company for our employer. This is for the community. This is for our consumers. And so regardless of what ideas I had at the beginning, um, and I, of course I had a lot of them, like it's changed. It's been, it's been uh, molded by listening to our consumer, not just our products, our content, um, a whole host of things, because that, that, at the end of the day, that's what matters. Um, and so I had keen, the keen ability to listen um, first and foremost. So when did the idea for Ray come to life? Like you have this idea, you, you know, you think, you know what you want to do. You want to find that, you know, fill that white space in the supplemental arena, but when did it become a reality and when did it become a product and how did it become a product? The product was the thing that took the longest and we spent the most time on because that was everything. Like a lot of the companies, you know, some people, some people will say, 
it doesn't matter how good your product is if you're a great marketer. I feel completely, I, I, I feel the opposite. <laughs> it doesn't matter how good of a marketer you are if you don't have amazing products and they don't work. And in our case, make people feel better. And so that was the start of it. And so the thesis behind the product was, gosh, you know, there's a lot of companies in, the, in this space that talk about just digestion, or there's a lot of companies in this space that talk about um, vaginal health or, you know, one, one particular aspect for me, it was about, gosh, if we're going to address her and think about her holistically, we better really think about stress, sex, hormones, digestion, skin, like all of the things, because to tease one thing apart, the number one thing we hear from our consumers is, I don't know how I feel, but I don't just feel right. And so is it sleep? Is it stress? Is it digestion? Like they're all so interrelated, but if you, you know, to tease those apart is really, really hard. And so we wanted to be really holistic and approach it from a mind and body perspective. Everything is not just physical. It's not just mental. It's, you know, that I talk a lot about sexual wellness. It is about stress. <laughs> it is about uh, energy and it's about blood flow, all of those things together. And so that was, that was kind of the thesis behind the product. And so finding a manufacturer took a while. Um, because our supply chain needed to be clean and really great. And we had rigorous testing. Finding a chemist um, was really, really important. Finding a product and regulatory person uh, to, uh, to understand FDA and, and how all of this works um, was really, really important. And so that was the longest lead time, if you will, um, to creating the brand was, was an understanding of the product. You, you mentioned a, a very, very, very brief mention of fundraising. So what, when did you decide to go out and raise funds and how did you, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. Because there's so many different avenues to do that. There's so many different avenues and there's not a one right way. I'm not convinced I, you know, maybe we didn't do it the right way, but, um, for, uh, for I love me, this, this topic, just, I don't mean to interrupt you, but I yeah. love this topic because no one talks about it. And, well, and, and, you know, as a founder, like, and I've shared this before on the podcast, like one day someone said to me, oh, like, are you going to raise money? And I was like, what do you mean? I didn't even know it was like an option. And I didn't, I didn't know what an angel investor was. I didn't know what friends and family around. I didn't know what all, I didn't know what a VC was. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. And just not enough people talk about it. And, you know, the big question when you talk to a founder who has a physical product is, well, I, you know, how do you have the resources to make it? And so I think it is so important that we change that conversation and talk about how you raise money and that it is an option. And if you have an idea, it doesn't just have to be an idea because you don't have that money in your bank right. account. So right. that's exactly. why I ask it. Totally. And exactly to your point, that doesn't mean everybody needs to go raise money, right? Like right. every business is so- I, did, I never raised so money. Different. I didn't raise money because I didn't have a product. I didn't need mm -hmm. someone to manufacture something for me. So I didn't need to pay someone that I, I, that, you know, and when it came down to it, I sold my company for the infusion of money for the resources. That yeah. was what it was. So you're right. Everyone has a different, you know, reasoning, but you, you mentioned it. And so yeah. I want to ask it. Yeah. Yeah. And when and how much and all of that. So, so I will say, regardless of if you're raising money or not, just make sure you get as much as you can for free, right? Like we didn't spend a dime on, you know, um, de product development because we worked with our manufacturer to help support that, you know, like, so, so again, there, there are ways to always, always ask the question um, and do as much as you possibly can for, for free. Um, especially in the early days. So we, um, you know, initially fundraising was, you in our case, it was have enough of an idea, have enough of a brand concept um, and enough of a, you know, size of prize and understanding of the industry to really um, be able to sell the idea effectively and a vision of what the future could be. Um, start with the end in mind to say, our goal is to impact as many lives as possible. And I believe it could be this and kind of back up to, to what your business plan um, would look like. For, for us, for me, for Ray, it was all about how do we raise a little bit? And then once we start to hit a certain point of scale and inventory is obviously the biggest investment in a business like this, how much, how, how little can we get by with um, to raise? But obviously then you want to buffer it, right? Is always, is always the, the guidance. And so um, we did a initial seed round 
um, before we cl we closed our Series A, um, which was December of 2020. And so we were about a year as a company before we raised our Series A. Um, and that seed fund really was obviously friends and family and some investors, but for us, it was um, to build and to scale because right away when we, when we started our website um, and folks started to notice, we were also you know, simultaneously having some conversations at retail and we're starting to get noticed really, really quickly. And so for us, um, that was kind of it is like, when you have that confirmation from retail, then you can really start to clo close the rest of the seed round. And then all of a sudden it starts to make a little bit more sense. So let's talk a little bit about the brand Ray. What is Ray? And, uh, you know, and, and what is, what does it mean? Because I think you guys have such awesome presence at retail and it is a noticeable brand. I mean, anyone, anyone who hasn't seen it, like really doesn't even go into a store. You know what I mean? Because you're everywhere you are, and it's very noticeable and it's noticeable in different parts of the store sometimes too. Like I, you know, I feel like sometimes I'll see it at the front of target, but then sometimes I'll see it. Like there's another department. I'm like all over target, like in like the beauty and health and wellness, there's, there's a lot of things going on. I feel like, and, and I feel like I see it a lot of places. So talk to us about the brand and the branding because it's genius. I mean, it's very noticeable. Um, Maybe you want to pick it up. You know, I mean, you see it everywhere and you're like, what is this? Thank I you. Take, I need to look, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Um, our, you know, I think brands have an opportunity to make change first and foremost. So that was always the belief. And you see that through um, how we, you know, help fuel the next generation through giving 5% back to Girls Inc. as an example, right? Like that is, a, I love that you do that. Love it. We have a responsive, brands have a responsibility to do better. Brands have a responsibility to make change in, within communities. And so I've always thought that, but they also have a responsibility to, as you come out, um, make change as it pertains to packaging and what it looks and feels like. And so for me, even as I was walking the aisles, thinking about what to buy for myself, I was like, gosh, there's a lot of like, what's vitamin A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and ashwagandha, you know, how, how do you think about products that are solution-based and then how do you communicate them more simply? Because there's a lot of overworked packaging yeah benefits benefits like how do you how do you simply communicate things and that is what is so genius about your packaging is that it is so simple and I'm hoping it's I mean it's it's clearly it resonating and, and but it's like it's like in the mood what does this yes. do gets you in the mood <laughs> right like what 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 does what does this uh, what uh if you if if you feel um stressed de-stress. That's another one of our products, right? And so for us, it was really important just to be overt about benefit first. Ingredients second, of course, it's important what's in the product, but but people will read um, if you catch their eye exactly to your point um, at shelf or digitally. And for us being an omni-channel brand, it was important to, to have it sit at shelf and communicate solely without a website. But then it was really important that it was postable Right. And, and really beautiful as, as people wanted to share, share online. Well, and I think too, so many brands, especially like legacy brands who have been around for a long time and before all of this being postable, you know, have a lot of work to do in terms of package reinvention and making sure that their product is postable because you don't see, you know, people posting packages of Oreos. Right. I mean, like you just don't like, yeah. that just, you know, so, yeah. and I know that that's a totally different category, but you, that's a brand that's been around for a long time. And like to, to the fact that you guys thought of that, I think is also a really good point that I want to emphasize. Well, and it's interesting because three years ago when we were initially fundraising, you talk about how, you know, fundraising, we got almost a hundred no's before we got our first yes. And the thing that kept coming up was, and, and, and as you're having these investor conversations, you really need to to understand what you're going to be headstrong about, but then open enough to say, I hear you. I understand your feedback. Like, I, you know, let me incorporate that into the business model. Cause you, that was actually a really good point. The one thing that I continue to be headstrong on is investors didn't love. They were like, well, are you going to be like digital or are you going to be physical? Because digital that's one business model and physical is a whole different business model. Like one, you spend your money on advertising, one, you spend your money on inventory and some didn't, you know, it's like, we're going to do both. And they're like, well, what do you mean you're going to do both? 
And I was like, well, we, like, that's how modern brands, I believe, needed to be built. And thank goodness now, as the rising costs of direct-to-consumer are where they are, thank goodness we have a physical representation right. in the retail partners we have. And as COVID hit and quarantine happened, thank goodness we had digital because nobody was in the stores. And so I'm just, I'm so grateful for the business model up front and that we're headstrong about that from the very beginning. And it also makes it so much more accessible to consumers everywhere and anywhere, because to your point, when you can't get it at the store, because if there was a supply chain issue and they're not on the shelf, you can still go online and get it. And also if you weren't going to the store, you could find the information on your website, which is amazing and so easy to navigate. So there, like it's genius. And I think just, I want to point this out again, what every consumer brand needs to think about before going to market today is these two channels and being present everywhere your consumer is in order to really blow it out. Right. Yeah. Well, and Hey, Hey, listen, like our roadmap at the beginning, like I said, from an, even from a partnerships and distribution perspective was like, we're going to do one, two, three, four, and five. That's all changed the retail landscape has changed, right? And so again, I go back to, it's all about listening, understanding, um, and to your point, following where she, go where she is. Like, I'm not gonna make her go into uh, somewhere she's not, right? Like, I, I, you can't change behaviors on that level. So you just need to show up in her life um, as relevantly as possible. So you're at a ton of retailers now. I mean, you, you're like everywhere. And I know your background is in retail. So what would you tell someone who's starting out right now who has a product that they're trying to get in retail? Like, what would be some tips that you would give them? And also, I mean, I think this, for you, this comes from wearing two hats, right? Because you've been on both sides of the desk here. I mean, you were at the retailer, but you also have a product that you got into retail. So what, what kind of wisdom would you share? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I think... I think a lot of brands and a lot of founders that I talk to, and again, I'm learning from other founders too on, on so many facets, but, but when they ask specifically about retail, um, they're like, how do I get into retail? And I'm like, well, that's one conversation, but how do you sell at retail is the whole, like getting into retail is one thing that just begins the, 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 the conversation, right? Like how getting in, is important selling through is even more important, right? It doesn't matter if you're on shelf, if you don't sell. And so understanding the dynamics of um, the tools, what that means, uh, packaging is one tool, right? In a CPG company, um, you know, how do you, how do you push versus pull demand? All of those things. And, and I'm not saying I'm an expert. I think, I think a lot has changed. Um, in the last couple of years. Um, but I think what's really important is retailers, um, especially as retailers are becoming more digital, uh, it's, they're relying a lot more on brands to drive that volume versus that discovery happening at shelf, right? Because people are buying online and picking up in store, buying online or doing drive up. And so I think the conversation of how to get into retail is really what's your business plan on how to sell through at retail? And I would start there. What would be some tips that you think work for sell through? Oh, I can only speak from our experience. That's okay. Um, di being digitally native has been amazing because um, we have cultivated a community. We have cultivated a conversation at my best friend. See, this is what we were talking about last night at my husband. See other women have libido issues too. Right. And so, so that, that has driven our ability to focus on paid media or focus on a conversation and then correlate those sales that happen and that demand almost by item. And so what we've been able to do is run a lot of tests, right? Like if we do this on TikTok, what happens at the retail shelf, drive those correlations and then kind of expand it more through, through the rest of the assortment. You said my favorite word and people who have been listening to this for a long time will know where I'm going with this, but community is my favorite word. I mean, I, you know, I built a whole company off of community and it's funny that you say, I can only speak to what worked for us, but I will say that community is so important for your brand, no matter what it is, whether it is a supplement company or a CPG, or it is a service-based company. It's so important to have community for what you just said, which is we've been able to 
run a lot of tests and we've been able to listen. And, you know, this also goes back to what you were saying with listening, because when you have a community, you can ask them questions and it's so important to listen to what they have to say. How much of your product comes from that? Uh, a lot of it. And you, you know, teach me so much about community, right? Given, given your background, but I think, I think it is, it is everything. It is um, what fuels us. And um, so many brands are focused on acquisition. How many customers can I get? I'm like, that's cool. That's important. How many customers can I keep with us? And how many customers can I keep happy and how do I do that? Well, first and foremost, it's having an amazing product that works. Secondarily, it's how you talk with them and, and you know, and, and have conversations. But um, I, I think it's everything. And, and our initial, you know, product development, we're around a certain amount of territories. Like I said, stress, sex, skin, digestion. For us, though, that's, di that's dictating the product roadmap. It is totally, we just launched chocolates. Um, I saw on your website time, too. You know, just because, because that, that came from our community is like, gosh, who doesn't love a little something after dinner, right? Like women, dark chocolates have a place in our lives for a really long time. Right. So it's, it's through that conversation that we're like, let's see what the response is to, to a product like this. So it is, it's, it's dictating our future. So you and I talked a little bit before we came on about, you know, just how everything's not always perfect. So what are some of the things that have not gone perfect for you that you've learned from and made changes because of? There's 15 things a day. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's all the time, right? I think as a founder, it's really important, um, you know, listing those, I could list all of those things, but I think, I think the biggest thing is it's a hundred things all the time. And so the mindset around it is what I've had to learn more than anything. It's like not the things that have gone wrong, but when the things go wrong, how do you navigate through that? And for me, it's it's if you are where you're supposed to be, which I firmly believe I am, you know, the universe told me that, guided me here, and I am exactly where I need to be. You start to see these things that go wrong or roadblocks, you start to see them as um, looks around corners or different ways up the mountain or different ways to see things, right? You start to see them as redirects. Um, because we've, we've launched products that weren't great, right? Like just didn't sell a couple things just didn't sell. And now we've retired them, but that's listening, right. And a redirect. Right. And so, um, I think that's the mindset that, that I have had to really make sure that I check, check on every day. And then the second thing is, man, the power of patience, because there are so many roadblocks. And when I say the power of patience, it is, I can't remember where I read this. But somebody said something as an entrepreneur, you just need to hang in long enough so that there's time for it all to work out or something like that. Like it's, 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 it's making sure that you have patience with yourself, knowing that, you know, we have this joke at Ray that like, if you think something's going to take X amount of time, at least five exit, if not 10 exit. And so it's this power of like, things take a long time. Good good things take a long time, good and, and lasting things take a long time to create. And so between the roadblocks and that patience, like that's what I'm doing the gut checks on because to your point, what went wrong? A, a lot. It's a yeah. lot of those things um, that I could list and talk about. So fundraising being one. <laughs> What's on the horizon for Ray? Um, uh, so we, so as you know, we're at, um, you know, we've got, we've got a robust direct business. We're at Target. Um, we are at Whole Foods, we're at Sprouts, Amazon. Um, what's really important for us is that we continue to keep those partners happy and sell through there. Um, I think what we're always trying to figure out is how do we add more value to our community? Um, and so that can look like um, partnerships, that can look like content conversations, right, to us and selling product, right? Like that's what's making yeah. our community feel better. But it's how do you deepen and strengthen what you give to your community um, that's on the horizon. Um, nothing I can talk about or announce now, but I think that that's what you're going to see a lot more from Ray is now we've learned. Now we're going to hit that button of add value, add value, add value as much as we possibly can. To our I can't wait to see. I really can't. I have one you. more question. This is what I end every podcast with is that I would love for you to share with our community people who are starting businesses, looking to start businesses, what are three things that you would tell them? Uh, 
um, you've got this because nobody tells you that. Nobody tells you that. Everybody points out all the things that are wrong, but at the end of the day, you've got this. Um, uh, <laughs> know your business model. That's everything and understand your business model and what you're trying to achieve. And um, probably um, start with the end in mind, right? And, and make sure that you know your why always um, because the why is, is, is the end. And then if you build everything back from that and what you're trying to accomplish, then, then it's not, it's, the roadmap isn't clear. It'll continue to evolve, but you can keep kind of checking in on that anchor of the end game. And I love that you are living your why and that that is how you started. So thank you for bringing this full circle as well. Angie okay. Tebby from, Way, from Ray Wellness. We will link all of where to find her and where to find their products in our show notes. But thank you so much for joining me today. It was such a pleasure to have this conversation with you. I'm so excited to share it with the Dear Founder community. Oh, 